ship was coming into sight in the bomb site. And then Willie wouldn't let me on the bomb site anymore. But what it boiled down to was he had guessed where the ship was going to be. And uh, he's watching there and he said, and cross my heart, this is the honest truth. He says, hit, damn it, hit. And I, I was watching, but not through the bomb site. One bomb hit a stern of that ship. And I think it was a, a, six, a six stick a bomb stick. And the next five went right down the middle of that ship. And it just went and that was it. And then the pilot took him down and the, the gunners strafed and so forth. But Bill figured that out where he was going to be after he made his turn and he set up his bomb to drop a certain time in a certain place and he got it. And uh, I never saw anything like that in my life. I think I might have mentioned to you, he was like a Charles Dickens novel. He was the best of bombardiers and he was the worst of bombardiers. He, when we would go in on a target on a, a shoreline or something, we would start out here with about a three minute bomb run. And, and uh, he'd say, Bob, I don't, I don't see it. And I'd say, well, wait a minute, Bill, you see the mouth of the river? Yeah, I see that. I said, well, you see you go in and then the river turns to the left? He said, yeah, I see that. I said, well, you see the, that green spats just beyond that turn? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, just off to the right of that and a little bit farther on is the target. Now, mind you, we've already started this three-minute bomb run coming in, and he's never seen the target yet. But once he saw it, he'd say, oh, damn. right down the middle, time after time. He was really, really good at what he did. There's no question about it. You did mention a little while ago that there were some heavily defended targets that you there was, went after. In particular, I think it was the oil refinery and storage yeah, area that right. you had to hit several times. Several times. Uh, it was called Balcapapan. Uh, and it was on the eastern shore of Borneo, and it was considerable complex. And uh, we had hit it, or someone had hit it before us, but uh, it was still almost fully operational. I think they were from a different air force than we were, but we won't get into that. So. We went and uh, we hit it, and uh, it was relatively heavily defended by flak. Remember, there were no fighters anywhere around here, and uh, as the as a navigator, once you get on the get out to the IP and start in, I didn't have anything to do except uh, sit on the floor in front of the bomb bay and there was an auxiliary handle that I pushed to make sure that the bomb doors didn't uh, creep down and hit a micro switch so that uh, the bombs would not drop and I just did this and I would sit there and look down and I would see those uh, the smoke from the flak bursts going past the formation. And of course, uh, if they're going by very slowly, that means that they're 
quite a, quite a ways below us, but when they got closer and closer, uh, that was not too good. Now, we never ever, to the best of my knowledge, got hit. Uh, we may have, because I heard flak tinkling off the side of the airplane occasionally, but as far as getting that's pretty close, isn't it, when it's tinkling off the side yeah, of the plane? It's close, but as far as being hit, being close enough for it where it exploded and did major damage to our aircraft, that never happened. But I'll tell you, uh, when we would fly these missions maybe every other day for a couple or three days, when they announced the target, there were many moans go up among the crews. But uh, we, you know, we're there, and uh, that's what we're supposed to do. Now, you had asked me about uh, a colored flak. I had heard of colored flak. Sometimes. Ships came in, uh, you know, cruisers or light cruisers would come into the harbor and they would add their anti-aircraft fire to the Army's anti-aircraft fire. Never when they were there did they fire colored flak at us. I have heard other crews talk about having colored flak because uh, that shows which ship is going high and which is going low and they can identify it. We had ships fire at us, but never with colored flak. Uh, and like I say, and the, I remember the only real uh, bomb run that I remember. Now I, I had seen a lot of buildings hit and explode and, and so forth. But the one that I remember, we dropped some what they call fragmentation bombs, which are just little bitty bombs, but there's a whole tassel of them. And uh, it, the, the string started before it hit this oil tanker, and it just tinkle, 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 tinkle across there. And just all of a sudden, that tanker, or that tank, exploded. It just looked like you took a can opener and cut the top of it off. And I still remember it coming up like this and then just falling off of the flames. And uh, we could see that fire from 50 miles away when we left. Okay, one other story about Valka Papin, and I've already told you this, Dave. One day, our pilot was flying with a new crew, and a lieutenant colonel from the 15th Air Force flew as aircraft commander with our crew. And we were, well, out of the 39 missions we flew, we flew 25 leads. And we came in, we made the bomb run, we had bombed Valka Papin, and the normal procedure when we were leading the squadron was as soon as the bombs were dropped, they would just take the formation and turn it and get it back out over the water and out of harm's way. This day, with the colonel flying, we had dropped our bombs and we just kept going straight and, straight and level, straight and level. And it seemed like forever. Now it wasn't forever, but, and it may not even have been five minutes, but it seemed like an eternity to me. And finally, I got on the interphone and I said, well, let's get the hell out of here. And uh, so he turned to formation, we got out of the flak, and we got out over the water, and just as we were approaching the water, he says, who said that? 
silence throughout the airplane. Who said that? Not a word from anybody. And then I had to go up to give him a heading to get back home. And I went up and I said, here's the heading home, sir. Thank you. And I said, did you ask who said that? Yes. I said, that was me, sir. He said, just what do you mean telling me how to fly this airplane? And this was nothing in the 15th Air Force. We used to go through this hour after hour and blah, blah, blah. And he chewed me, it seemed like halfway home, but it was probably just about 10 minutes, telling me that I had no business sounding off. He was not in, I was not in control of the aircraft. I wasn't responsible for the aircraft or the crew. Yep, 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 yep. And I'm just saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And uh, finally he said, that's all. And I went back and sat down. And uh, my seat was behind the co-pilot. And the radio operator's seat was right across the aisle. It was only about 18 inches wide. And he leaned across and he says, Lieutenant, we all thought the same thing, but you're the only one that said anything. So I figured, okay, if, if, the crew, if the crew felt that way, I didn't really lose any skin with the colonel. But, uh, now, there were, you also mentioned, I think, that there were some, uh, some missions that were flown effectively as close air support for some invasions. Yeah, yes. Walk us through a little bit of that. Okay. Well, before I do that, I would like to tell you this one last hairy tale, and then we will be easy. Like I say, we had sunk this one ship, and uh, we were feeling pretty good. And a couple days later, we went out, and boy, we found another ship, and we thought, boy, we we got it. And uh, we turned and started in on a bomb run on that ship. And all of a sudden here there is fire coming from that ship at us. And those tracers were going past us and this was a great surprise because those uh, supply ships and troop ships didn't have that kind of weapons. And uh, one of them hit us and ruptured a fuel tank. Boy, there was fuel all over the airplane. And of course, fuel is the lifeblood when you're flying long missions out over water. So immediately, the, uh, the engineer got busy transferring fuel out of the tank that had been hit into the other tanks that were intact and finally he salvaged all the fuel that was in the tanks and put it in the others. And the pilot asked him, he said, okay, how are we fixed for fuel? Well, he had been efficient enough and fast enough that uh, any extra reserve that we may have had, we didn't have anymore. But we had enough to get home. And uh, after flying for 45 minutes or an hour, all the fumes were gone and so forth, and we just landed at home. Well, it just happened that we had a combat photographer with us, and he had taken pictures of this. And as a stupid crew, we did not stop to identify the ship. And it was a Japanese cruiser that we were coming in on, not a ship carrying troops or supplies. So uh, they made an issue of it in the squadron that how important it was for ship identification. And they they didn't punish us or anything, but they, 
they informed everyone how important it was. And last, or late that night, we were playing poker and the line chief came to us and he says, uh, uh, and he identified our crew and he said, do you know what this is? And he held up a projectile about that big and about that big around. And we said, no. He says, that's a 20 millimeter incendiary shell. He said, and I just took that out of your ruptured tank, but it malfunctioned and did not explode. And you can't tell me that God didn't have a hand in that because, uh, you know, had it exploded, we'd all been dead. But uh, that is the only, only really close encounter that we had in that entire 39 missions. And uh, I just think the Lord was watching out for us, and that's why I say I had the easiest tour that anyone ever had uh, if one incident, one failed incident in 39 missions uh, is all that happens, you're very blessed. Okay, about this covering invasions. Uh, we covered the invasions, as I recall, in Terracan, in Sandakan, and Borneo. These were all, again, supply route stations for Japanese supplies. And these were not, excuse me, marine landings, but they were army landings. What army? I don't have the slightest idea. But when, it, when the invasion was scheduled, the Borneo was so isolated and these cities or towns were so small, relatively speaking, it was too far for fighter bombers to get to to support the invasion and uh, they weren't important enough to bring in Navy ships to bombard uh, you know, the installations prior to and during the invasion. So they sent us and they had uh, a number of us go. I don't remember whether it was a whole squadron or just three or four of us. And they were loaded with various types of munitions you know, 250 or 500 or 1,000 pound bombs and so forth. And uh, we would arrive at the invasion on D-Day and H hour and just circle offshore. And if they needed ground support, one of the commanders on the ground or prior to going in, before they got on the ground, he would call and he would say, I need a uh, thousand pounds on this coordinate. And the, the bombardier would, uh, would, allow, would uh, arm the thousand pounder and we would locate the coordinate. And then, like I say, I would walk Willie in <laughs> to where it was supposed to be and, and uh, go in and drop. Uh, and uh, then j just the one or maybe two and then we would just go out and continue to circle and they would call in for the ordinance they needed to support their invasion and when we uh, arrived at a point where we had just enough fuel